Hello and welcome to the August Recreational Astronomy Night Meeting online edition of the RESC Toronto Centre. My name is Paul Markov coming to you from Markham, Ontario. And uh, I've been a Toronto Centre member uh, for the past 39 years and my passion is deep sky observing. Um, I've been organizing and hosting these meetings for the past 20 years, and I'm always on the lookout for speakers. Uh, so if you have a presentation in mind, uh, please get in touch with me. We have openings for the October and later meetings. Uh, before we start uh, with the presentations, I'd like to thank in advance uh, tonight's technical team uh, that's made up of Andrew and Betty Reed, uh, Ward Legro, uh, and Ennio Cellucci. Uh, thank you all for making these presentations possible for us. We have three presentations this evening as usual and I expect will be done around 9.30 p.m. Uh, the speakers for tonight are Andy Beaton, The Sky This Month. Uh, we have a special guest, uh, the Victoria Center President, uh, Randy Enkin. He'll talk to us about selenophile or lunatic, 30 years of observing and loving the moon. And then Ron McNaughton will talk to us about weighing the earth two and a half centuries ago. Uh, Tom Luton, our president, will wrap up the evening with the announcements. Um, if you have any questions, please enter them in the YouTube chat box and Ennio will ask the speakers uh, the questions on your behalf. And also if you are, are attending a meeting for the first time, whether you're a member or not, please also say hello through the chat box. So let's get the meeting started uh, with the sky this month and Andy Beaton. Uh, hello. Am I on? I guess I am. Hi, my name is Andy Beaton. I uh, am speaking to you from downtown Toronto in the uh, my basement fortress of solitude, and I'm talking about the sky this month. Start off a uh, usual uh, list of what we've got coming up, uh, the big picture, important dates coming up, uh, the moon, the planets, something in the deep sky, double stars, variable stars, and whatever's coming up in the way of interesting space flight odds and ends. Uh, the big picture we'll start with, we're looking uh, west around sunset later tonight. Um, actually looking more south on this one because west was looking kind of uninteresting. What we're looking at here is the uh, summer Milky Way and everybody's favorite summer constellations up and down the Milky Way, starting uh, Scorpius at the bottom and heading up to Cygnus at the top. The important thing that we want to look at here is uh, planets. Um, Pluto is there, and we're at the uh, time of year where we've got our favorite uh, gas giants coming up, uh, Saturn and Jupiter there. Um, I also see here that uh, we've got a couple of minor planets uh, Haumea and Makemake. Um, as it turns out, uh, very few of us are going to see it, but if you're an experienced observer with a large telescope, uh, trying to image one of those would be an interesting project. Heading towards our next uh, meeting on September 8th, if we get up at five in the morning and uh, take a look out uh, the window, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see all your favorite winter constellations showing up. It's uh, that time of year. We'll have our Taurus and Orion there. And uh, we'll also get the ice giants, uh, Neptune and Uranus, and uh, minor planets, uh, Eris and Ceres. Ceres is one you'll actually be able to see. I know it's, uh, it's depressing to think we're already seeing winter constellations, but uh, you know, the summer is uh, blasting through here. We're past the solstice, so nights are getting longer. Um, astronomical twilight's going to end around uh, 10.30 tonight and start again at 3.45 in the morning. By the time we get to the next meeting, uh, twilight will end uh, just past 9 o'clock and uh, start again at 4.45. So that's good news for people who need to uh, get up in the morning and can't stay up too late observing. And it's also good news for the uh, imagers who want uh, lots of good time out there to observe and uh, gather up some uh, long uh, duration photos. 
So important dates coming up, uh, new moon on August 8th. Um, the moon is at apogee on August 30th and perigee on August 17th. I like to include that because I think it's a cool photo project for uh, people getting started in photography to take pictures of the moon at those two times and compare the uh, images side by side and be able to see them, uh, see how much it changes. I've uh, thrown in the notes far and close for apogee and perigee because I'll be honest, I always forget which one's which. August 22nd is the full moon. We have a triple transit of Jupiter on August 15th. Unfortunately, we aren't going to be able to see it here because uh, it's in the middle of the day. But uh, since we're now a multinational podcast here, I've uh, thrown it in anyway. Anybody watching this from East Asia or traveling that way should be able to see it. And of course, the big news for this time of year is uh, the Perseid meteor shower. Um, that's coming up on August 12th and the few days either side of it. And Venus will be occulted by the moon if anybody is watching this from New Zealand. Hello, New Zealand on May 12th. Oh, what the hell? August 12th. There's always something I miss typing when I go through this. So we get the new moon on August 8th, uh, first quarter on the 15th, uh, full moon on the 22nd, last quarter on the 30th. And this is an exceptional month for, uh, for us because we get a second new moon before we get to our next meeting. Uh, August 15th, we also have uh, the appearance of the Lunar X. And for people who don't know, it's a feature on the moon that when it's illuminated from a certain angle, the intersection of the rims of two, cor two craters makes a cool looking X. I mean, it's not scientifically exciting, but it's a cool thing to look at. And uh, if you've got uh, family or friends who are curious about what we do in astronomy, Looking for the Lunar X is a cool thing. Unfortunately, it's uh, 6.30 in the morning, so you're not going to have it for your evening barbecue. But if you get up, getting up early for work, it should be visible. So the planets coming up, uh, the small planets, um, it's a lousy time for Mercury, um, at least for the northern hemisphere observers. Further south, it'll get further from the uh, horizon than it does for us. But up here, it's uh, going to be a dead loss. Um, Venus is currently low in the evening sky. Um, by the time the sun sets, it's uh, pretty much gone as well. It'll be a bit better by the end of the, uh, the, end of the, the month. But uh, for now, it's, uh, it's there. I, really bring it up because uh, one of my cousins called me yesterday saying, hey, what's that bright thing in the West? And I was able to answer her. So I'm sure the rest of us will probably have our friends and family asking the same question. Uh, Mars is disappearing into the evening twilight. It's getting smaller and further away as it gets to the opposite side of the sun. It's a mere three and a half arc seconds across. Um, even if the conditions were good, it would be really hard to see anything worth looking at. These are the stars uh, this time of year. Um, Saturn rises not long after sunset and uh, Jupiter follows closely behind. Um, unfortunately, neither of them are at particularly high declination, so we're not going to get astonishing views of uh, amazing detail. The atmospheres. Uh, getting in the way, but uh, moons and rings are still going to be there. And you know, once again, if you've got friends and family who haven't seen these things, you know, drag them out, uh, find a telescope and show them the rings of Saturn and the moons of Jupiter. You know, that's the stuff that uh, makes new generations of astronomers. This is something that uh, Dennis Gray uh, drew my attention to a couple of months ago. Um, the Earth is actually crossing the orbital plane of Jupiter's satellites. It happens every six years. We've got 192 observable events from March 3rd to November 16th. Um, 
uh, we're actually getting close to most of the the, uh, the end of most of them. There'll be a few stragglers uh, into November, but uh, this is probably the the last month. We'll see more than one. Um, here's the website um, if you want to uh, track them down for yourself. But uh, for our own purposes, um, from Toronto should be four observable events. On August 8th, uh, Ganymede is eclipsing Europa. On August 9th, uh, Ganymede occults Europa. And that's the planet or the moon actually passing in front of the moon and not just casting a shadow on it. On August 12th, uh, Eo eclipses Ganymede. And August 19th, Eo eclipses Ganymede again. So if you're out and observing, yeah, see if you can catch these. These are going to be uh, pretty fascinating things. And August 15th, we have a triple transit, um, Callisto, Europa, and Ganymede, all passing across the face of Jupiter. Um, unfortunately, it's daylight for us here. You might be able to see something depending on how the seeing is. You know, I've looked at Jupiter in the daytime and I've definitely seen the big stripes. I don't think I've ever seen a moon of Jupiter in daytime, but uh, I'm not sure I've ever really tried that hard. So. If you're out in a boat with your telescope uh, at 11.30 on the 15th, eh, give it a shot. What's the worst that can happen? You know, re record a failure. We've all done that. Further out in the solar system, we have the, uh, the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. Um, Uranus rises just before midnight, and uh, Neptune rises just after sunset, both of them visible all night. Uh, Again, the same problem with we, we have with the gas giants. Um, neither of them are very high in the sky. Otherwise, they're good. And if you're looking for a challenge uh, project, um, finding the moons of uh, Uranus and Neptune, are, it's, they, they take some work. I've seen one. I've, uh, I've seen Triton. And uh, that, that was hard work. It took a lot of... Uh, a lot of checking and uh, watching over time to see the thing is actually moving, but it was a, a satisfying uh, result when I confirmed it. And I know they're dwarf planets, but I'm including Pluto and in Ceres anyway. Uh, Pluto's in Sagittarius. It's uh, getting away from the Milky Way finally. So it should be findable in any 10 inch or larger telescope. Um, I saw it with an eight inch telescope once, but it was uh, well away from uh, the Milky Way and there were very few stars competing with it to be uh, confused with it. So I would say as close as it is to the Milky Way, you'd want something a bit larger than that. Uh, Ceres is a eighth magnitude object in Taurus. It's uh, visible in the east before dawn. And uh, it would be an interesting project as well to track it as it uh, moves throughout the month. So I always like to include a bit of deep sky stuff just because uh, there's so much stuff out there. It, everything deserves to have a look, a look at it once in a while. Uh, the more North American nebula is the one on my mind uh, this uh, this month. And uh, you know, there's a picture. We've all seen it before, but this is a, a really nice one that I got from the ESA and NASA and uh, the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. Monstrously huge diffuse nebula in Cygnus, um, so huge that you know, narrow band telescope is not going to uh, get it. You want a wide field telescope or binoculars to really get to the full thing in. Uh, it can be seen with the naked eye if the sky is really dark. Um, if you know what you're looking for, it looks like, looks like a brightish patch in the Milky Way. Um, I'm not sure I would be able to distinguish it from any other bright patch in the Milky Way, just a bunch of stars, if I didn't know exactly where I was looking and what I was looking for. But it can be done, and it is there. And uh, while you're at it, you can uh, scoop up the uh, dark nebula LDN 935, the uh, Gulf of Mexico, onto your observing log. There we go again. There's... Uh, that Gulf of Mexico between uh, Mexico and Florida in the, the pseudo map. Um, as you can tell, it is 
not uh, missing matter there. It's uh, just dark matter blocking whatever's behind it. There should be way more stars there, but uh, the ones we see are the ones between us and it. And if you're looking at it and uh, you're more than a, a beginning amateur looking for something more challenging, a 13.2 magnitude star, and I won't bother reading out the designation, is the ionizing star for the entire nebula. For a while, they were thinking that uh, Deneb was the ionizing star, but it's not nearly bright enough to get the whole thing. And if you're interested in other uh, projects, um, there's a whole bunch of dark nebula in and around uh, the North American nebula, and mapping them out and identifying them would be a, a project to take uh, for more than a few nights. So we have comets and meteors. Um, the Perseids are the obvious uh, meteor shower. Uh, everybody is always excited about that one. My coworkers are always already asking me what's going on, what should I do? And the obvious answer is uh, get as far as you can from the city and lie down and look up. Uh, really starts on the 10th and goes to the 14th, but it is peaking on the 12th. And this year, uh, the moon is setting early, so it should be an excellent meteor hunting year assuming that A, the weather is cooperative and B, the forest fires are cooperative. But uh, I plan to be out on a beach somewhere uh, for as much of the night as I can stand looking for meteors. Um, that's the meteor shower. We also have some meteor dribbles. Uh, the southern delta aquarids, the alpha capricornids, the kappa cygnids, and the origids. Um, all of them pretty long duration uh, showers, looking at uh, you know, between one and five meteors per hour. I wouldn't advise actually going out to look for them just for the sake of seeing them. But if you are out and you do see a meteor, um, check, the, uh, check the direction it came from, check the date, and see if you can identify it as uh, one of those meteors. We have some comets. Um, C2020 P2 Palomar in Virgo is the, uh, the most promising one. It's uh, just under 10th magnitude. Um, it will set fairly early. Virgo doesn't stay up long. Uh, 15P Finley, 10.8 magnitude in Taurus if you're up in the morning. And C2019 L3 Atlas, 12th magnitude in Origa. Um, 12th magnitude isn't spectacular, but if you're really addicted to comet hunting, it's out there for you. I'm also uh, going to bring your attention to C2021 A1 Leonard, uh, 15th magnitude in Ursa Major, but it's getting a lot of press as a giant comet that's going to be the comet of the decade. Yeah, we've heard that one before. But uh, keep an eye on it if you've got a large telescope or uh, long-term uh, photography facilities. Sure, start looking for it now. See if uh, we can see anything happen before it uh, either becomes big and famous or fizzles like uh, many other comets of the decade have done. I don't know if Blake is here tonight, but uh, I want to keep uh, on his uh, good side by bringing in a, a double star. Uh, Kruger 60 is the one I've uh, found for this week, this month. It's a 9.7 magnitude uh, pair in Cepheus, um, 8.9 or 9.9 and 11.4 magnitude respectively, and they're about uh, two arc minutes, two arc seconds apart. So if you can split the stars in epsilon lyrae with your telescope, you can split these guys. Now, the reason I picked on these guys is their 45 year period. Um, depending on the, uh, the angle of inclination, that means we're going to be seeing up to eight degrees of the orbit per year. So every year you go back and observe this guy, you're going to see this, the secondary star moving around the primary. And 45 degrees, you know, that's, many of us are going to be able to sit through an entire orbit uh, you know, knock on wood, assuming we, uh, we all live that long. But uh, you know, it's, it's a project that uh, should be manageable. And it's not my sky this month without a variable star, because 
people who have known me in the Toronto Center know me as the, one of the variable star guys. Uh, I picked on Beta Persei this month, um, better known as Algol. Uh, this one's uh, different from the ones I usually go for. It's uh, not an intrinsically variable star. It's not a star that varies in itself. It is an example of an eclipsing variable, two stars which orbit each other and just happen to be lined up, the plane of their orbit lines up with us. So as the two stars orbit each other, they take turns blocking each other's light from getting to us. And that uh, light, uh, that, that brightness curve will change over time as, uh, as one star or the other blocks the other. Now, What's interesting about this is, although it's a nice steady orbit, uh, we've discovered over a hundred years of observing that the period is changing very slowly and very, very subtly. And why that is happening is a very interesting question to professional astronomers. So what we can do, that is you and I, is uh, get out there with our telescopes and our observer's handbook, there's a page in here, your, your basically your monthly, uh, your sky guide will tell you when the minima are expected. Uh, set up your telescope uh, beforehand and every 10 minutes, measure the brightness, record it. The brightness you're measuring is gonna be compared to nearby stars or you can do it the uh, really cool way and set up a photographer photometer or a camera or something, uh, measure the brightness of that uh, star, go back another 10 minutes, measure the brightness until it returns to normal. Um, and you can submit that data to the American Association of Variable Star Observers. And what they will do is they will collate that information. And if you are a professional astronomer who wants to know how the time, how the orbit is changing for this variable star, you can download that 100 years of data and get that uh, collected wisdom of the thousands of amateur astronomers who have been gathering that data. So we got a few things happening in spaceflight. Um, I'll be honest, we're at the point where uh, Falcon rockets taking up Starlink satellites is no longer a highlight. It's just turned into routine stuff, so we'll skip that. We have uh, perseverance and ingenuity on Mars. Um, that stuff never gets old. I, you know, I, I'm old and jaded in the astronomy business, but uh, seeing a helicopter fly on Mars is just too cool. Um, we have a Boeing Starliner crew capsule test coming up sometime soon, and uh, the time, the, the flight time has is to be determined. I think it was supposed to go up yesterday and got uh, postponed. Uh, we have the Chinese rover driving around on Mars. They're the second country to actually get a working rover on Mars. So I'm sure they're going to have interesting things to share with us. Um, over the next month, um, the ISS will be passing over early in the morning from 23rd August until the next meeting. I don't think anything visible will be happening in the night until then. Um, if you're not in Toronto, or you want exact times and locations, uh, heavensabove.com is the place to go. And because I have been an astronomer for a long time and I know it can happen, I can tell you that uh, you're going to be facing many cloudy nights or many nights when the wood smoke from the forest fires is too much and you'll want something else to do. So I'm going to direct you once again to zooniverse.org where there is a heap of citizen science projects. Uh, we have the Zwicky Chemical Factory, where you are going to be invited to analyze data and search for elements created in stars, whether in supernova or uh, any other uh, uh, nebula resulted from exploded stars. We have uh, Citizen ASASSN. I bet they pronounce it assassin because it sounds cool, where we're classifying variable star curves. Aurora Zoo, which is all about the classifying different types of aurora and uh, uh, timing it with uh, different uh, behavior on the sun. 
and the old famous old classic galaxy zoo where you get shown a picture of a galaxy from some deep sky survey and your job is to uh, identify the type and uh, classify it for uh, the use of once again professional astronomers and i hope we get enough clear skies that all this won't be necessary but there they are if you want them and uh, that's what I've got for this month. So thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'm ready to answer them. All right, Andy, thank you so much for a great presentation as always. I know it takes a lot of time to prepare it. So thanks again. Well, let's go to Ennio with questions. So I have a few questions myself, if, my, if I may ask. Um, for C2020 T2 Palomar, is it showing any sort of tail yet? And for C2021 A1 Leonard, what's the expected brightness? Okay. Um, Palomar, uh, as far as I know, there is uh, no uh, tail being no tail visible, at least not for from anybody I've talked to with a, a telescope of an amateur uh, amateur size, eight to twelve inches. Um, as for Leonard, um, expected brightness, I have no idea. It's it's pure wild speculation. Um, it's a large comet, and it's going to be coming fairly close. But uh, the problem is predicting brightness of uh, first time comets is unnaturally difficult. It could be, uh, it could be above zero, it could be six. Um, nobody really knows. And I don't think I've ever seen anybody make a prediction they want to stand by. That having been said, I'll make a wild prediction and say it'll be above zero. It'll be the brightest comet any of us have seen in decades. And if I'm wrong, I'll give you your money back. Thank you. We have a question from Leo to Kath. How long does it take Algol to decline from full brightness to the minima? Oh, that is an excellent question. Um, I don't uh, know off the top of my head, but uh, if you're a member of the RASC, you probably have this fantastic book here. And it will tell you that the period between uh, uh maxima is uh, 2.8 days but it doesn't actually tell you how long the minima itself lasts i believe it's on the order of an hour um it's been a while since i've actually done that one um i've done a couple of other ones which uh, tend to be between uh, 15 minutes and two hours of brightness so i would have to look that up to give you a, an accurate answer Leo DeCaf has a follow-up on that question. Um, off topic, the period, but from the start of the decline to the minima, or rather not the period, but from the start of decline to the minima. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one I don't uh, have an answer for you quickly or easily. I'd have to look that up. Okay, and I have one more question. For the first year it's expected this year, how many meteors are they expecting per hour at peak? Usually the Perseids peak at about uh, 60 an hour. If you're under a dark sky, you'll see one a minute on average. You'll, um, the uh, brighter the sky, the fewer you're going to see. If you're looking from Toronto, you might see one every 10 minutes. Cool. And I believe that's all the questions we have. Thank you. OK, thank you. All right. Thanks again, uh, so Andy, for your presentation. Let's move on to our next speaker, Randy Enkin. Uh, he is the president of the RASC Victoria Center. And uh, the subject of his presentation this evening is Selenophile or Lunatic, 30 Years of Observing and Loving the Moon. Over to you, Randy. Thank you very much. Just a sound check. Can you hear me? Very good. I want to say, first of all, that I am so impressed with the uh, the Sky This Month uh, segment. I, in preparation for this uh, presentation tonight, I watched a few 
of your uh, past uh, recreational astro astronomy nights. And I think they're unparalleled. I, I watched several of these things and uh, the detail and the enthusiasm of the whole team of people that are doing these, it, I'm enjoying it a lot. I'm gonna be following it in the future. Anyway, yes, I, uh, I'm a Selenophile. I love the moon. I, I know that there are members of our community who think of it just as light pollution. Uh, I, I'm actually sad when it's new moon. I, I wonder what am I going to do tonight? It's, 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 my thing is the moon. So let's have the slides move. Very good. It started for me on uh, June, July 20th, 1969. I was uh, at summer camp up in Halliburton, sitting in this room. There was never any television except for this one night. They put two fuzzy black and white uh, televisions and everybody was in there cross-legged and it was to watch the uh, first landing on the moon. And, you know, all the other kids wanted to be astronauts. I, I thought it was the astro astronomers that were the really cool people. And so that kind of set me on my way. And uh, here's a picture of me in 1970, a year later with an eclipse of the moon. Uh, public address, uh, public announcement, uh, never view the sun directly through binoculars or a telescope, it will wreck your eyes. But uh, you can look at it with projection as I did when I was uh, 10 years old. And uh, I just kept at it. I, I was never a serious astronomer, but it was always something in my life. And um, so, you know, here we are 50 years later and I'm still crazy about this moon. Here's my talk. I'm going to uh, spend most of the time talking about this 30-year uh, time series of observations and how it's, uh, it's kind of been driving my, my lunar observations. But uh, then I uh, joined the RASC a few years ago and I got caught into these wonderful observing programs. And I'm gonna finish off with a great passion of mine, Enkin's Daily Moon. So let's start with the 30-year uh, time series, uh, which started in 1990. Uh, I'm not really sure why, but I, I just had this idea and I had no idea it was, I was going to keep doing it. But we got to start by uh, just getting common idea of uh, how the phases of the moon work and what notation I'm going to use as I record it. So as I'm sure everybody in this community knows, the phase of the moon comes from the angle between the moon and the line between the earth and the sun. So as the moon goes around the sun, then you see different parts of the surface of the moon illuminated. And for the purpose of my measurements, I uh, use this uh, convention. So, you know, first quarter is 25%. Last quarter is 75%. That's pretty obvious. But what that means is that the full moon is 50%. And that, that's kind of funny, but just go with it. So zero for new. And we go through the waxing to, uh, phase, the crescent, quarter, gibbous, come around to the full. And then we are in the waning gibbous, third quarter and crescent. And then we get it to a new moon again. And uh, it's a very simple game. I just... Every uh, time I see the moon, just naked eye, I look and say, hmm, that's going to be a 87% uh, uh, moon. So let's let's see what that looks like. So uh, these are pictures, not great pictures, but I took them with my Raspberry Pi and I kind of like them. Uh, so first of all, is this a uh, first quarter or last quarter? Well, there's the Mari Procellarium, the Embryum C. This is the last quarter. And it's a bit past it. So why don't we call that something like 76%? Ah, 77 when I did it with uh, matching an ellipse to the Terminator. Okay, now we're on the waxing side. And there you see that beautiful uh, Rupus Altai, the Altai scarp around the Mare Nectaris. Anyway, so there would be a quarter moon, 25%. That would be 12, so 13, 14%. 
But yeah, there we are. Okay. It's hard when you're around the full moon. Sometimes it's really, really tricky to see whether it's before or after. You got to look quite closely at where the Terminator, but we can see here the Terminator is on the right near the uh, Mare Crisium, the, the, the Sea of Crises. This is after 50. This is going to be 51, 52%. Yeah. And one more example. Oh, tiny thumbnail of a uh, moon. So uh, this is going to be a very old moon just before new. It's going to be somewhere around 97, 98. There you go. Okay. So I just do it by eye. I don't do this uh, imaging stuff. And in fact, it's really tricky doing it by imaging. It really depends on your exposure, but it doesn't matter. Part of the game, I'm a geophysicist. I love playing with noisy data. And so what I've been doing is I've just been taking these really very simple measurements writing them in my book. So there we are this morning. That is the 2021-08-04 at 3.11. Yeah, I actually set my alarm clock. If I set the alarm clock so that I can get up when the moon is about 10 degrees above the horizon, then I can see it through the crack in the skylight in my washroom. And so there we go. And, and it was 89% this morning. So every month, every lunation, I add a hundred percent. Okay, so I go from zero to hundred, hundred to two hundred. Now I'm up into the uh, many thousands, and uh, this is set right now at uh, zero. Was in the year uh, 2012 when I restarted these measurements. Um, there's been a lot of life during these 30 years. Uh, so you know, I started when I was doing my doctorate in Paris, and then I did a postdoc in Edinburgh, then I went to Victoria, got my real job with the Geological Survey of Canada. Meantime, I had three children, Daniel in Paris, Simon in Edinburgh, Hannah in Victoria. Um, I kind of, life got a bit overwhelming after six years. Then I got missed it, and so I started again. Then I went a long time, then I was an empty nester. And I started being able to actually do real astronomy by staying up late at night, much better. So uh, th this is uh, right up to today. And um, if we take the slope of this line, so the rise over the run, then it gets to be you know, a bit over uh, between three and 4% per day. And if you divide 100 by this number, then that tells you how long it takes to get from new moon to new moon. What is the synodic lunation? And uh, when we compare this to what, what much cleverer people with telescopes and fancy equipment do, um, I'm now 180 seconds off what uh, is um, astronomically determined, or 71 parts per million. Just to compare, the last time I turned the crank, which was a couple of years ago, uh, it was about 76 parts per million. Um, fun fact. The uh, Babylonians had the value accurate to 0.4 seconds. Now, they did measurements over a couple hundred years to get that. And so I, uh, you know, but also they did a lot better measurements than I do. So taking that slope of that line, getting that one number, that's great. I mean, I just love it that I'm able with just my eye and writing down numbers for 30 years, I'm getting such an accurate measurement. But where I'm really excited is when you subtract that straight line and you start looking at the deviations around it. And when I started doing this, I saw that there was this kind of getting faster and slower. And I thought at first it was every year. And then as I went through a few years into it, then I realized it's more like 14 months. And now as I get through to uh, 30 years, 32 years of this, um, it's 412 days. And this is actually a thing. This is not just bad measurements. It was recognized in the 14th century by Ibn al uh, And it has to do with how fast the perigee is going around the Earth. If the perigee were fixed to the stars, so if the, if the um, moon if the moon's orbit, that the ellipse was always in the same ellipse as you went around the year, then it would be exactly 12 months that they, they um, 
because it would just be the motion of the earth around the, the sun that would, would affect things. But it's a three body problem. It's actually a many body problem. Jupiter has quite an influence on the moon also. Um, and so it ends up that it's about a 14 month uh, shift. And uh, the Babylonians actually did have this because it's important in the measurement of when the um, the eclipses show up. And that was very important. So through the ages, this has been a known thing, but I just discovered it with this simple measurement. And I love that. There's also a variation that you see each lunation and that's fascinating too. So uh, it hasn't got boring yet. I'm going to keep doing this. Oh yeah, there's my picture. I wanted to uh, remind you that by Kepler's second law, you've got the moon going faster at perigee and slower at apogee. And, uh, you know, this gets into the press, you know, everybody talks about super moon and they, they, they're all excited about it. And of course, it bugs me. It bugs me that they say, did you see the super moon? And of course, you can't see it with the naked eye. It's not a big difference between the uh, super moon and the micro moon. It's only 7%. Okay. And, and, Oh no, no, seven percent in brightness. It's it's uh, ten percent in size. So that's why uh, Randall Monroe gave this uh, little spoof of what Superman would be like if he only were the same difference as the uh, super moon was. Okay, the thing is, it is really important for my understanding that variation, that that fourteen month variation it's really important to get the difference in size. And I tried with various techniques. And uh, finally, I uh, got my family to spring for this beautiful 1941 sextant. I love it. And so every time that I see the moon now, I also take a measure of its diameter with this sextant. And uh, so uh, this presentation, the first time I'm showing off this data, I just turned the crank this weekend, uh, pull it, pulling it together. And so um, what you do see is it gets bigger and smaller between about 32 and uh, high 20s. They, they, there's some calibration problems I was having and it shifted here because the mirrors moved or something. I, I'm still learning my sextant uh, work. It's a wonderful thing. People have been using it for centuries for navigation and you get better at it. It's one of those skills that, you know, it's just like using a telescope. You got to spend time with it to get better with it. Anyway, uh, let's take a look. The, um, the new moon is uh, where we have these uh, reds. That, that's the old moon, the, the blue. Oh, actually, let's, let's go for where it's a full moon because people always talk about super moons and, and micro moons when it's green, when it's, when it's a full moon. So when I started a couple of years ago, I, uh, it was a super moon when it was full and then follow these green points. And we see here when the full moon, it's a micro moon. And then lately it's been a super moon again. And now the green points are going past. It's going to go through every, every um, month, the shifts when, when you get the super moon and the micro moon. Super cool. Where is it going to take me? I don't know. Give me, let me, give you another talk in 30 years. Oh, these red lines and blue lines, those are what uh, the astronomers tell us when we are at perigee in red and when we are at apogee in blue. And it looks like my measurements lead what the astronomers are telling us. I'm interested in that. Let's see what happens. Okay, that was chapter one. Now let's go to chapter two, the uh, lunar observing programs. So for most of those years, I didn't have a telescope and I wasn't that interested in the surface of the moon. But then, um, you know, things change. I got myself a telescope uh, and I met people in the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. It was only about four years ago. And one of the wonderful things is the observing programs. There's the Explore the Moon program, the introductory program which took me three lunations to accomplish. And then I, I am the most recent recipient of the Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program. 
can't tell you how much I appreciate the work that went in to the organization of this. It's a wonderful tour of the surface of the moon, and I can't recommend it enough. You really get to know our nearest neighbor, and even people who don't like the moon, who say it's just light pollution, once they get doing the Explorer of the Moon and the Isabel Williamson, it, it, they, they love it. And I want to say, if you are doing, if you're working towards your Isabel Williamson certificate, I'd love to get in touch. I think that the, we're, we're all doing this separately and uh, it's, it's something we should do together. Anyway, I'm not going to go through my whole Isabel Williamson talk because I spent the time on that other stuff. So uh, let me just show you three of my sketches. I, I, I became a sketcher because of this. And uh, so this was a sketch I did on July 7th in 2019. Important because it was the best view of Tranquility Base where Apollo 11 landed on the moon. I, so on the 20th, so a week and a half later, I, this wasn't so visible. It wasn't near the Terminator. But here we see the Sea of uh, Tranquility and that's where it landed and it was very fun. And I got to give a talk at the center of the universe, the museum here uh, in uh, Victoria, the Astronomy Museum here um, that next week. And so I could show off this picture of what it looked like through my eyepiece. Here's my favorite crater, Clavius. Clavius. Uh, it's remarkable because it has this series of this arc of craterlets that makes this beautiful uh, crescent, uh, each one getting smaller. So these guys are about 12 kilometers apart. You have to go here to see a eight kilometer diameter crater. These guys are four kilometer. I couldn't pick them up that day. So that tells you what your resolution is. And this was a particularly good day. I often can't see this one. I've sketched this particular uh, crater probably a dozen times by now. Here's a wonderful view of the Imbrium Sea. Uh, another one of those craters with craterlets that I love is Cassini. Hard to see at first, but then you can find it. Uh, the Apennine Mountains, uh, Apollo 15 is at uh, the Hadley Rill over here. Uh, it's a great view. Anyway, so I did all of the 300 uh, features with these sorts of sketches and uh, submitted it. And then I got this very nice pin and certificate and I get bragging rights and I'm very, very pleased. And I'm still doing it. I'm still sketching. I'm still having fun with it. Okay, chapter three is a completely side project of mine, Enkin's Daily Moon, which you can sign up for on Facebook. I've also started putting it on Instagram. And every day I just post another picture of the moon. The moon represents the passage of time, illumination, the feminine and world unity. I've been posting a daily moon since August, 2014. So that's seven years I've been doing it now. So here are a few examples. I started off with uh, some iconic pictures of the moon and, and from the ISS. This one I'm very fond of. A friend of mine who knew how much I love the moon made me this windsock. This is in my backyard and uh, I just love this. Okay, so here we jump to moon 93. Uh, this is uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night. And what I really like is like moving in and then you actually get to see what was Van Gogh's hand doing when he was painting this. I, I, and, and then you also see the passage of time with the cracks and the dust. I, so, so this is still the moon. This is another aspect of the moon. What I love is all over the world, every society has the moon as a symbol, symbol for all sorts of things. Outhouses, New Yorker. Oh my goodness, New Yorker covers are so good at, at showing pictures of the moon. I often uh, do those, but look at this guy. This is dated 1942, August 22nd, 1942. And what this artist is showing is he, here is this poor young man who is in this, this terribly violent situation on this bomber during the Second World War. 
but look at his optimism, his bright, his, his, his sense of unity with the world looking at the moon, even though he has this very destructive job to do right now. This is one of my favorite pictures of the moon. I went to Chicago and with a friend, wandered around the city with all the skyscrapers taking pictures of the, uh, of the moon. That was a really fun day. Walked a lot that day. Then there's 2017 eclipse. This is remarkable. I mean, take a look. You've, you've got the amazing corona. You've got the uh, activity on the surface. But you actually see the Earth shine. The dynamic range that is represented in this picture is just fantastic. And look at that. Somebody was very lucky getting this uh, double eclipse. And you even get the, uh, the jet trails behind this, 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 um, this uh, airplane. And this was the picture from, uh, what's it called? Jacob's Tree in California. Anyway, lots of planning to get this picture right. Uh, sheet music. You know, before there were recordings, they, they, the way people got their music was by sheet music. And they had wonderful um, covers to these. So uh, lots of songs about the moon. Moon is a universal symbol. A couple of years ago in May, the uh, Museum of the Moon came to Toronto. Here it is in the Aga Khan uh, Museum. So you could get nice and close to it. And then they hung it in off the Gardner. So the Gardner Expressway is right above where, where the moon is. And they held concerts and things there. That was really good. And uh, I'm jumping forward. This is this week. I'm doing uh, railway bridges. So here's the furthest fourth. And uh, here is a painting of the bridge in Maastricht. OK, so come and join Enkin's Daily Moon. Doesn't cost you anything. You get to see some delightful pictures of the moon every day, not like you would see through your telescope usually. So I'm just going to close. When I did my first 1,000, when I got to moon 1,000, uh, I made a video at my son's request where the moon is always in the same position, and it goes through from the waxing crescent through the full moon to the waning crescent. So pay attention around here. It's going to go fast. So here we are in our waxing crescent. Lots of people do pictures of the waxing crescent. It's very funny. Very few gibbous moons in the world of art. That's my trip to Chicago that I showed you. These are a few gib gibbous moons. Now we're into the full, lots of full moons, of course, waiting for Godot, Netsuke, Rhodes, Paul Clay, New Yorkers, Songs. I've got several themes that I just love. George O'Keefe, wonderful artist, critiques. Etchings, birds. I just choose themes and I go with them. Coming to the waning crescent. And we end with a new moon, actually a solar eclipse. And with that, I say thank you. Thank you so much, Randy, and a very interesting presentation. Uh, I am unfortunately one of those people who thinks of the moon as uh, light pollution and a nuisance, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, especially all the measurements you took over the past 30 years. Very well done. I appreciate you uh, offering your presentation to us. Uh, let's go to Ennio. Uh, do we have any questions for Randy? No, we have a number of questions and a number of comments that came up. <clears throat> so one of the comments that came up was uh, from Louis Rifkin. In light of this, the moon landing, maybe watch today's episode on YouTube's of Two Funny Astronauts. Eric Briggs asks, <clears throat> your diameter measurements are great. Isn't it easier to measure the supermoon effect by timing the moon crossing the meridian on successive days? No, no. I mean, what you get there would be the speed of the moon. And uh, so, yeah, by Kepler's second law, you can get that. But what I'm trying to get is the distance to the moon using the, uh, the, the direct measurements. Um, I have this 
hope. I've got uh, uh, lunar imagers that are friends in Florida and here, uh, Gary Varney and Mike Nash, and I'm hoping that I can get them to take pictures at exactly the same time and use the parallax to get the distance to the moon. And then from the relative differences, I can uh, then work out what the ellipticity is. Uh, but your idea is good uh, that using the um, using Kepler's law is is the complementary way. And I guess one of the things that I'd like to do is can I reconfirm using these simple measurements? Can I reconfirm Kepler's laws? Part of my game is to work out how our predecessors in the astronomy world actually worked out what they they got. And and if I could from Simple observations rederive Kepler's uh, second law. I'd be a happy camper. So we have a, co a couple comments where one gal says, "Is there a listing to tell when a feature on the moon is at zero degrees sun angle?" And which Eric Briggs responds with, "It's possible there isn't a listing of non-sun angles for lunar features." Measurements of the lunar terminator are much more common, so you can add in or subtract nine degrees from that. Okay, so let me just say that the tool is the Science Visualization Service, SVS, of NASA. They have dial -a moon which is the most useful thing every hour of the year. It comes out in December of each year, and you, you can take a look at what is um, going to be visible uh, again every hour of the year and I've now got a bit of a reputation among lunar observers and so people actually write me and say when will I be able to see such and such and I uh, I do that with the SVS I doing it mathematically is one of my uh, on my list of things to do I want to uh, get going on uh, doing some some work with python to put in dial in a lunar latitude and longitude and figure out where the the moon and the sun angle will be and a particular project i'm keen on is to look at where the uh umbra hits the moon during an eclipse fortunately we were clouded out uh in was it may but i have high hopes to uh do timing of, of the umbra going across in November when the, we have the next uh, eclipse. And to compare that, I need to do some programming in Python to, um, to be able to figure out wh where the relative positions are of sun, moon, and earth. Yeah, I'm going to need to pester you about some of your Python code at some point very, very soon. One Gallagher asks, so if Piton is at a terminator, we could add 12.2 degrees per day. After that, to measure height? Whoa, I didn't get the question. I think he's asking whether you can add 12.2 degrees per day and use that calculation to determine Piton based on when it passes the terminator. Uh, Piton's terminator pass day and time, and then use that to determine its height. Okay, that's assuming a circular orbit, I believe. Anyway, wait. that person should contact me, please. Randy.enkin, oh no, president at rast, no, victoria.rast.ca, president at victoria.rast.ca. So whoever that was, I'd love to get to a talk about it because it sounds interesting. The one, please feel free to reach out with your question. Andy Beaton asks, have you seen Mary Orientale? Any hints on spotting it? Oh, Orientale is wonderful. First of all, it's cool. It, it's in the West and it's called the Eastern Sea because it was only the um, the NASA uh, Apollo missions where they it was too confusing having East and West like it is for astronomical versions instead of how we, we use it on Earth. So they switched. So the Mare Orientalis is in the West and depending on the libration, you see more or less of it. And it's one of the really fun things to, to check out is how much of it is visible. You never see more than, oh, I don't think you ever see half of it. You only see like between 10% and a quarter of it from, from what I remember. But you can see the these concentric rings, the, 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 the um, mountain 
ranges going around its center. It's, it's an excellent target. Awesome. I'm going to have to look for that myself soon. Lewis R. asks, do you hope to take a trip to the moon? Heavens no. <laughs> no, I'm actually very much against space travel with humans. It, it, it's dangerous. It's expensive. I'm all for sending robots. I, I think that uh, we, we, we learn so much more. I think that the putting people in space is really a propaganda exercise. Sorry for the people who really, really are keen about going to Mars or whatever. Uh, but robots are the way to go. I'm staying on Earth. And I have a couple of questions, if I may. Sure. So for the Luna pick that you shot with a Raspberry Pi, yeah. which camera and lens did you use? OK, that was an afocal uh, measurement. So I. Uh, I made this gizmo that swung the Raspberry Pi camera into the eyepiece so I could accurately put it back in the same position. So I would line up where the moon was and then put it in. The eyepiece, I use a Celestron Ultima Duo. Uh, I think I only had the 10 millimeter at the time. I've also used a five millimeter. And uh, at the time, I think that was a five inch Newtonian. My main instrument now is a uh, Canadian built and um, what's it called? Omicom six inch. Interesting. So you didn't use the official Raspberry Pi camera then? Oh yeah, the Raspberry Pi, Pi camera, a focally over the, the eyepiece. And one last question that I have. So you mentioned the ring of craters impacting in Clavius. Yes, Does yes. the shape of that ring tell you anything about the impacting body? Uh, well, first of all, it tells you that Clavius is an old crater because it had so many impacts. And second, I, they're not in a line. So I don't think it's a uh, Levy Shoemaker sort of scenario where that was one event. I think it's just a wonderful cosmic coincidence that it produced that beautiful pattern. And you know, you, you get enough monkeys typing, they'll type up Shakespeare. You'll you'll get asterisms, but I don't know what the word is for 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 craterisms. Craterletisms. I have to make up a good word for that one. Sounds but good to me. And that's all questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Randy, thank you so much once again uh, for uh, volunteering to present to our center. Really appreciate your time. Let's move then to our third speaker, uh, Ron McNaughton. He'll talk to us about weighing the earth two and a half centuries ago. I am so fascinated with how astronomers could do really accurate measures along measurements a long, long time ago. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, two Peter McNaughton's. Uh, one of them is my brother who has given me incredible help with the research. And the other is a direct ancestor who moved to Canada in the 1820s who was born near the mountain. So uh, there's a bit of a connection here. Um, there are a number of themes that I'll be talking about. One is the shoulders of giants that the um, uh, very uh, great scientists have led the uh, groundwork for this experiment. There are also changes in technology and London was one of the best places in the world for designing equipment and things, uh, telescopes, and the hardship that was endured by astronomers trying to work things out. So I'm going to start with a giant and this is a picture by Roy Bishop from the uh, Halifax Centre of his home and he was very involved, uh, Newton was very involved in optics um, and he uh, did experiments with uh, rainbows and found you can break light into white light into colors with a prism. And then he found a second prism, you can put it back together again, which surprised many people. He did lots of experiments with alchemy to create uh, gold out of other elements. And he ended up running the Royal Mint, including doing some undercover work to catch people. And of course, there's an apple tree in this photo as well. And we've all heard of the apple incident, although it didn't land on his head. Uh, he told several people the apple story. Uh, his niece, he said, it's the apple falling that first got me thinking about gravitation. He was studying physics at the time, and it was uh, Aristotelian physics. 
Uh, he saw an apple fall and wondered why it fell towards the earth center. He told the person that took over from him running the Royal Mint. And another person he told, if that force reached the apple, could it have reached the moon? And that was his niece's husband where he was living together. Um, definitely he told these stories. These were near the end of his life. He often had people that questioned his uh, primacy of discovery. And he also had mercury poisoning from his experiments. So I don't know, but I think it's pretty clear. So what was known then? The radius of the earth was figured out about 250 before the common era. 400 years after that, Ptolemy figured out um, how far the moon was away at about 60 earth radii. The acceleration due to gravity was measured, Galileo and others. Galileo did a lot of experiments with ramps um, and I couldn't exactly work it out. Now I mention that because in Newton's wondering if the force of the apple could make the moon go around the earth, he actually calculated what the gravity would be at that distance, and it turns out it's 1 60th of the gravity at the Earth's surface. And he wondered, maybe the gravity force drops as 1 over the square of the distance. So Newton uh, did, uh, often did not publish discoveries, and once uh, Edmund Haley came to visit and said, well, somebody wondered about a 1 over distance squared uh, pattern, and uh, would you be able to calculate what the path of the orbit would be? And Newton said, oh, I've already done that. And he was fiddling around with a bunch of papers. And then uh, he said, I can't find it. And a few days later, he recalculated it. And um, uh, eventually he put all that into Principia at age 44. So many of us have studied physics and the university of law, universal law of gravitation says the gravitational force between two objects is proportional to the product of the masses, and it could be the Earth times my mass, divided by the square of the distance between the centers. Now, there are other ways of wording it, and in my classes, it was an equation with a gravitational constant that's one of the big three in physics, and I would get the students to work out what would the force be between a 50 kilogram girl and a 70 kilogram guy separated by 30 centimeters and they busily would use it and they regretted taking physics because it's only like a millionth of a Newton. So this force is very small for everything, uh, everyday things. Um, anyway, this relationship also allows the relative mass of any object with a satellite to be calculated. And the distance to the moon and its period was known then and through telescopes and uh, illuminated reticles, they could work out the radius of the orbit of Io, and the period could be worked out by many observations. And just from that information, you know the, the mass of Jupiter is about 315 times the mass of Earth. But neither the mass nor density of Earth was known, which means you couldn't find the density of Jupiter, which tells us something about what's in it. Surface rocks are something like two and a half times water, What's the whole earth? That was the experiment. And Newton wondered if a mountain could deflect a plumb line, but didn't think it could be measured until Neville Maskelyne. He's another giant and also the villain of Davis Sovell's wonderful book, Longitude. And in 1761, there was a transit of Venus uh, visible from St. Helena. And he suggested, why don't we also get a certain type of telescope that looks straight up and see if Sirius over a year moves compared to the other stars. And that would be conclusive proof that the Earth does go around the sun because some people still argued about that. The main argument being, why don't the stars move as we have a year? Anyway, he um, enjoyed looking at clouds during the transit but he tried to measure how Sirius uh, moved in the sky and the instrument wasn't consistent and he did experiments to figure out what the problem was and in a dramatic meeting of the Royal Society he showed what the problem was and suggested an improvement and that's a problem that most of these instruments had before. 
Maybe because of that, at age 33, he was appointed the Astronomer Royal, and that is quite an important position in Britain in charge of the Greenwich Observatory, making sure the balls drop at the right time for navigation, etc. cetera. Um, among other things, he also organized the Transit of Venus expeditions for 1769, and poor Captain Cook had to go to spend a few months at Tahiti rather than enjoy the wonderful Arctic winter that Wales and Diamond did near uh, Churchill. Anyway, the results turned out, including those two good observations and the average distance of the sun was calculated a couple of years later within a percent or two. The next year, he proposed an experiment to measure the weight of the earth by measuring the effect on a mountain. And he started a committee of attraction, which included Benjamin Franklin from the United States. The committee figured the mountain had to be high enough, about uh, a Monroe 3,000 feet or uh, about a kilometer. It had to be detached from other mountains, which make the list Lake District mountains not suitable. A ridge, if there is one, roughly east-west, and it has to be in the kingdom of His Majesty King George III, who helped provide the money. The committee hired Charles Mason to do uh, go up to Scotland and Northern England. And he's the one that surveyed the Mason-Dixon line in uh, six years earlier. And he recommended, and it was accepted, to pick Shehalian Mountain that is exactly in the center, geographical center of Scotland. This is a map from a report uh, a few years later. <clears throat> and in those days, they showed elevation by shading the sides of the mountain to show it's steep. But this hill is a lot less tall than that hill. So it has limited work, but the ridge goes roughly east-west. Now, here comes the idea behind the experiment. If a plumb line or a weight at the bottom of a thin wire is deflected, then there's some angle and that angle is going to show earth gravity goes down, the mountain gravity goes sideways. And then the angle that ended up being about six arc seconds <clears throat> per side shows that earth gravity is something like 30,000 times stronger than mountain gravity. And from that, they can calculate it. But how do you measure that accuracy of this thing bending? I want to do a side trip into latitude. It's defined as the angle between horizontal and the celestial pole. And if somebody wants, I can explain a little bit more what horizontal meant. This is rather subtle. So if you measure a celestial pole as being 56.7 degrees above the horizon, <clears throat> that means you're on that latitude. But just as longitude and latitude give the east, west, and north, south location on Earth, Right ascension and declination give the comparable values for um, stars. And a star at declination of 56.7 degrees will be exactly overhead from that latitude. Pitlochry's a really wonderful town that I drove through on the way from central Scotland to Loch Ness and other things in the north of Scotland. It happens to have a store that uh, has my family name on it, and I bought a nice jacket from them. It's exactly east of the mountain and has latitude 56.7 degrees north. If you have a telescope that can look straight up compared to some line that hangs straight down, that star will be directly overhead. But if it's deflected by a mountain, now the star is not overhead. And it turns out what they did is they put a station on the south side of the mountain or an observing site and another one on the north side of the mountain and they compared the effects and that's how they measured this incredibly small angle two and a half centuries ago. So they picked two observatory sites starting in the south and they hired uh, people to dig it away to make a flat area. This was dug by hand I'm not sure how they made the soil solid enough to hold astronomical equipment because you don't want it to move over the months. Um, and the North site. Now, Masculine <clears throat> Astronomer Royal was supposed to stay in London to make sure everything worked right. 
and he was used to hobnobbing in the royal court. Uh, he asked uh, Charles Mason to do the experiment, but Mason said no. Uh, he wondered about somebody else, and then he got special permission to do the observation. So he spent four months in a bothy that was made near each of the sites. Now, this is just a small hut. Uh, this is made out of rocks, but there don't seem a pile of rocks at either of the sites from people that went there. So it must have been wood. And he lived there for four months. This is a picture from an expedition to Ecuador. Uh, by a French group and uh, they chose to hire an artist to show how the observation was done. Uh, it just so seems wrong while you're right in the middle of an observation to have a door open with wind blowing in, but that's the uh, artist. Now I wanna talk about this, this instrument that's called the Zenith Sector. It looks straight overhead and it measures the angle between exactly overhead and a star when it passes from the east part of the sky over the meridian which runs from due south to the zenith and back to due north towards the west part of the sky so you only have one chance every day to measure a particular star so the person here looks through the eyepiece um, the crosshairs are illuminated by a candle that uh, is here and there's a little diagonal mirror to reflect light down and he follows it. Now these instruments only looked at a small patch of sky so what they had to do is look at the charts of stars and say the next one we can see is going to be three degrees south of um, uh, overhead so they've got to point this to the right direction and somebody else looks at the clock and says okay we're close and then they only look for a short period of time it's not like the person spends uh, all night long looking up this drawing this is the most important feature and from the very top of the pivot of the telescope they had a plumb line that ran all the way down and uh, they measured the angle from there the one used at Chehalion was different. It was 10 feet. It was made for St. Helena. Masculine found the problem, designed a solution. This was done on this, and he used it on the mountain. It was returned, but to my knowledge, never used again, and no picture or sign of it anymore. But there's another instrument of this type, and there were typically three to five instruments like this at any given era. And this was made in 1727. They measured aberration and nutation with it, which are two phenomena I wasn't that much aware of. It's um, because it was sent to South Africa at that year, they decided to hire an artist to make good pictures. And fortunately, I can show them. And it gives a sense of how these instruments are used, because that's what I'm trying to convey is the incredible effort to uh, measure the cosmos and all the little details that had to be right. Anyway, this is 12 feet tall and all Zenith sectors swing north south from the top and it has to be exactly aligned and uh, masculine got it within uh, an arc minute. The eyepiece at the bottom to look at the star is at the bottom and this happens to be pulled all the way to the left but it also can go all the way to the right. Um, the key thing here is the green arrow shows where the plumb line went. And I'm going to show expanded views of those uh, in a bit. Um, this is the optical tube and the angle arc is fixed to it. And the back arc is connected to the frame of the telescope and their little screws that could tighten it. It can swing back and forth and then you tighten it and hold position. The actual arch with the measurements in the 1832 one was calibrated every five arc minutes and there was a gold dot at each one. Now I find the artist was not exactly consistent like that gap there seems smaller than that gap. But that doesn't matter for the art but it did for the actual manufacturer the incredible accuracy to get each of the dots in exactly the right place it just so amazes me. Unfortunately, when the first one, when the, the one uh, masculine used was made, you couldn't make arcs in degrees um, because they didn't know how to divide a circle until uh, a dividing engine was invented by Mas uh, Ramson, they couldn't do it. 
So he had a different scale and each division was about three and a, three and a third arc, uh, arc seconds, uh, a little bit smaller and he just counted and then converted later. Now, this is the microscope that looked at where the plumb line that goes all the way from the top and comes down uh, crosses the angle arc. Uh, it's some sort of a pot and some of these had a liquid to reduce, uh, uh, to dampen the swings. I have no idea how this is illuminated because this was done at night. You couldn't have a, uh, a candle in front of it because the moving air would disturb the accuracy of the measurement. Uh, you couldn't have a candle to one side and then the plumb line wouldn't get centered. Perhaps what they did is had a candle that mounted on top. I don't know, but somehow this had to be illuminated to be seen. So Maskelin would, after finishing an observation, writing everything down, he would select the next star, push the tube to close to the expected angle, tighten the screws. There are actually two, but one is hidden behind. Then while holding this micrometer that can adjust it, turned the micrometer as he looked through this and to line the, uh, the uh, uh, plumb line to exactly go over one of those gold dots. Then after doing something else, he would observe the target star when it was predicted to be close to exactly on. And the difference in turns was recorded. And that's the measurement, except I said I would talk about the problem with the 19, uh, 1761 Zenith sector. This is a sketch by Maskell to illustrate the problem. How most of these instruments back then, they had a structure like this with um, uh, cylinders that come out and it hangs on that. That's the pivots that have to be exactly east-west. And one of them was turned down a little bit and then enlarged like two cones meeting each other. And they had a plumb line that hung from it and after his experiments, he realized that the plumb line wasn't slipping consistently. So he came up with a design that probably got him to be selected as Astronomer Royal. This is a sketch from the 1832 model, and this is the top of the telescope. I don't know if they had uh, dew shields or maybe had a cover that was on it when they weren't actually observing because they don't want it to get um, uh, dewed up. And these are the pivots that hold the telescope. And they're oriented exactly east-west. This is a solution. I took the previous image and reversed, uh, flipped it here, by the way. And there was a gold dot on that pivot point. Then they took this piece and slipped it on. And they removed the covers. And they put it that this V-notch held that pivot and this V notch held the other, and then they put the covers back on. Once it got hung from the top, this structure sat on, a, on a, the top mount. Um, once they got it on the top, what happens is the astronomer for every observation would climb up, use a microscope like here, and he would look at how the plumb line here matched the dot on the pivot. And he would move it back and forth so it was exactly in line. Then he would have to go back down and replace the um, uh, to the exact spot. And then he would um, time it to be able to observe the star. The, um, this instrument normally sat in a wall in um, uh, the Greenwich Observatory, but when it was out in the field, they had to make some wooden structure like this. And given that people had to climb up, there had to be a second structure for climbing. And I sort of think of Maskelin in a windy night that's still clear, so he wants to observe, climbing up this thing, somehow balancing to be able to hold a light to look to the exact um, position of the plumb line uh, without dropping it and lighting a fire to the whole thing. The concentration that he had to have to uh, do all this observation over four months was rather incredible. 
Anyway, this structure allowed um, the actual telescope fit in these pivots here. And after he did about a month of observations on one side with the pivot to the east side, if this is north, then they turned it around 180 degrees, lined it up again exactly to um, the um, north-south direction, and then sighted the same stars again. And the only thing he recorded was um, the, uh, the actual dot location. So here it would be 25 arc minutes, whatever the number of degrees is. And then the number of micrometer turns to get to uh, the crosshairs. So what he then did is he would record things down and this got into his paper. So this is for the star 33 Cygni, like uh, this is sorted by RA. So uh, they were all like, these are a bunch from Cygnus. He went 14 of his divisions south, that's about three quarters of a degree south. And on July 24th, he turned the micrometer north by one full turn and 0.2 parts that are about an arc second. On the 26th, a little more, 29th, a little more, and the 31st, it was all one turn plus 3.1 there. Then it was turned, and I don't know how, but in one day he was able to get it turned and all aligned again. And this time it was north with no turns, but 30 uh, parts, and he was able to get four observations there. Um, once he finished doing both sides and that eliminated uh, errors in the thing, then the whole works was carried up over the mountain and back down again. So they must have brought up the wooden crates that held everything that has to be at least 10 feet long, packed it up, took that structure apart in about two weeks to do all that. And I've talked to Boyd Harris, or emailed Boyd Harris and also Karen Rand who also has been in the site and some of the rocks are loose and it's very tricky to walk on that site. Fortunately, everything worked out. It got to the north and then poor Masculine spent another two months observing from there. In four months, with much bad weather, Masculine made 337 observations of 43 stars. And the conclusion of part one is he found that the result after adjustments for aberration and nutation and all sorts of other things was 54.6 arc seconds, the precision from two and a half centuries ago. That's the difference in angle of stars between the north and south. Part of it was the latitude difference, but part was clearly attraction of the mountain. And that was proof that all matter has some gravitational attraction. Now, I have a lot to continue telling you about the second half of the experiment and how they finally got a density of the earth and how it was used. And uh, this gives you a sense of some of the things. So I'll continue it next month. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ron. The ingenuity way back then is just amazing. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. And uh, we look forward to your uh, second part, which will be at the uh, uh, September uh, 8th meeting. All right, do we have any questions for Ron? We do have one comment from Eric. <clears throat> Starlight from a Zenith telescope can also be slightly deflected by the aberration of light. I'm not sure if that deflection would be more or less than a plumb bomb defect deflection from a mountain. Um, aberration of light, I want to make an analogy to what it is. Um, it's because the Earth moves at 30 kilometers a second in its orbit, and light moves 10,000 times faster. And our motion compared to light can actually be detected, and it was first detected by the uh, 1827, or sorry, 1727 uh, instrument that I showed all those detailed pictures of. I'll give an analogy to what causes it. 
let's say you're in um, a flat area on a road where there are no trees, it's just open farmland, and the wind is blowing from the side with snow. So the snow comes straight from beside you. But if you start finishing the stop sign and progressing forward against the wind, suddenly the snow, instead of seeming to come straight from the side, seems to come a little closer towards you. And if you drive really fast, it seems to be coming straight towards you, even though compared to the earth, it's moving sideways. And that's the effect that causes aberration. And it was adjusted for by various procedures that were talked about, but I didn't get into. And it's about 20 arc seconds. And it's most common in stars that are south at midnight. So we're moving one way. It's the light from stars that are across that are the biggest factor. And it turns out that stars on the ecliptic and it's all the stars in that area it's not like one they move back and forth the stars on the ecliptic but stars 90 degrees to the ecliptic move in a circle and it's about 20 arc seconds across and it can be measured and it had to be adjusted okay awesome and we have another question from eric the deviation caused by the aberration of light is much smaller than the aberration caused by deviation from plum caused by the mountain. What was your number again? Tw 20 arc seconds. Oh, the mountain was 56. And the um, uh, aberration of light is something like uh, 20 arc seconds. But again, it was adjusted for in terms of the different months and the procedure. Anyway, keep going. And that's all the questions we have. Thank you. OK. Anyway, if I can just mention one more small thing, and I'm going to post it to the Toronto uh, Centre email group. Um, the Outreach uh, Education Public Outreach Committee is running a workshop on processing Mars picks and more. And what you can do is there's a program and you can get a simple version for free or pay for a better one. And you can actually download raw images that come right from Perseverance. And what you do is uh, you can process them and you might be able to see a picture before maybe anybody else has looked at it in detail and maybe find something. This is an example of citizen science and it could be fun. Anyway, I'll post this to the Toronto Centre um, email group, but uh, it is um, um, uh, going to be an interesting program and I'm signed up on uh, August 26th, uh, 20, 29th. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much, everybody, and keep safe and look forward to observing soon with other people. Great, thank you so much, uh, Ron. I know it takes a long time to prepare all that information and slides. Good, so that concludes our speakers for this evening. Let's go to our president, Tom Luton, for the announcements. And good evening, everyone. Hope you're doing well, getting a little observing done. So let's get started with the announcements. So as Paul was saying earlier, we've got two types of meetings. Uh, we have our recreational astronomy nights in which members will come and talk about things. And starting up in September uh, for another season is our speaker nights in which we have a member of the astronomical uh, faculties of one of the universities, for example, will come by and uh, give us a chat. Uh, all, both of these meetings are on YouTube. Uh, if you're here for the first time, please say hello. Uh, enter some questions for the presenters. If you're new, introduce yourself. And if you come from far, far away, please let us know where you're from. Oh, and on that note, uh, I'm currently speaking to you from downtown Toronto. Uh, so our next recreational astronomy night is on the 8th of September. Chris Vaughn will be discussing the sky this month. Dennis Dray will be talking about a Coat Watcher version 4.0 uh, with a review. And as you've just heard, Ron McNaughton will be continuing Weighing the Earth Two and a Half Centuries Ago, Part Two, um, here on YouTube. Uh, members, if you'd like to present something, please contact Paul Markov. So the first of our speakers nights for the upcoming season uh, will be on the 22nd of September. Dr. Leo Yvonne Alcorn, a postdoctoral researcher in astronomy at York University and the Dunlop Institute, will be discussing the color out of space and other tales of cosmic horror. Sounds a little more Halloween than late September, but well, 
we'll see what else we got for October then. Uh, here on YouTube. Coming up at the DDO over the next few weeks, we've got several things. On Thursday, the 12th of August, between 7 and 8.30, we've got a talk on the Perseid Meteor Shower. This is a free talk, uh, but you do have to register online. Links are at rasto.ca. Uh, DDO up in the sky um, on Friday the 13th at 9.30, $12.50 uh, registration cost. Uh, DDO Astronomy Speakers Night um, on the 20th of August at 9.30. We'll have a guest lecturer and we'll be using the uh, Great Big Telescope to uh, see a few things if the weather behaves itself. Again, $12.50 uh, fee and online registry. And then finally, Sunday Stargazing on the 22nd of August at 12.30 p.m. Uh, fee of $6.78. All uh, links to all the registries requirements can be found at rasto.ca. So you heard a little bit about one of our observing certificates tonight, uh, the Isabel Williamson Lunar Certificate, but it's one of several. Uh, just making a little shout out here. Uh, if you have been working on your certificates, taking advantage of some of the downtime from COVID, um, or we're wondering if you've gotten a chance to finish one. And if so, please let the observing committee know so that they can uh, forward the paperwork and get you your nice little pin and certificate. There are several certificates, explore the universe, explore the moon with binoculars or telescopes, Messier catalog, the finest new general catalog objects, double stars, the Isabel Williams, Williamson lunar certificate, deep sky gems and deep sky challenge. More details at rask.ca slash certificate dash programs. Uh, education and public outreach activities. Most of our activities are currently on hold because of the COVID outbreak, um, but virtual star parties are in the works uh, with Ontario Science Center, Millennium Square, the David Dunlop Observatory, the St. Clair O'Connor Community, the Dunlop Institute, with Brownies, Cubs, Scouts, Schools, and various schools, as well as the new observers to visual astronomy. So contact public education at rasto.ca for more info. Our observing sessions are unfortunately suspended until further notice at Baby Village Park, Long Sioux Conservation Area and Ontario Science Center. But the CAO is partially open. Starting July 3rd, we're accepting uh, online reservations for campers, day users, and modal and locker leaseholders. Lease holders. At this time, we are not accepting reservations to stay in the house because we have some COVID-related safety renovations to complete before that's possible. The Sioux Laura Observatory is open. The Jeff Brown Observatory is still closed. Full details are on the website, and please read everything carefully before you make your booking. Um, we're looking to fill some jobs. So um, the observing committee chair and, observe, and committee members, uh, we are looking for a light pollution committee chair. We're looking for national council reps, a marketing committee chair and committee members. Our AV committee uh, who makes this wonderful programming uh, needs a few additional hands. The education and public outreach folks need some additional help. And as well as part of that for our virtual star parties, we will require some telescope camera operators. Please drop a line to volunteer at rasto.ca uh, if you can help out. And this is the part where I get to plug the membership in the RASC. Uh, you can renew online. Uh, if COVID has uh, tossed things up in the air for you a little bit, uh, the RASC does have an emergency fund. It is completely confidential. If you'd like to discuss that or gift memberships, please contact Adela in the national office at mempub at rask.ca. And with that, I'd like to wish you a good night. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you can visit us on rasto.ca and as well as all across various forms of social media. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell. Uh, be safe. Keep looking up. and Have a good evening. Good night. <music>